Uh, my dad is from Golden Lake First Nation, actually Pequawkanagon First Nation, but he wasn't allowed to be there because um, he was non-status, but that was where he found his, his, that's where his home was in his heart. Not only is my name Lynn Gale, I'm non-status Algonquin Anishinaabe. I'm, I'm not a band member of my grandmother's First Nation, which is Pequawkanagon First Nation. So there's layers there because I'm non-status. I'm not um, a band member and I'm not a citizen of the Anishinaabek Nation, so it, it moves through those, those uh, issues. And um, because I'm non-status, I'm not entitled to treaty rights. Now that might be a little bit confusing because I've told you that we Algonquins did, you know, they didn't sign a historic treaty. And uh, while well, that is true, what eventually happened is um, treaty rights were given to all status Indians, whether you had a treaty or not. And so treaty rights would be education and health care and the right to live on reserve and hunt and fish. And so I'm not entitled to the, those as well. And, and you can link those treaty rights back to the treaty at Niagara. So even if the individual nations didn't have a treaty with the British or the Canadian government, those treaty rights go back to the treaty at Niagara in 1764. So even though the Algonquins don't have one, we do have treaty rights, but I don't have them because I'm a non-status person. The reason I don't have, the reason I'm a non-status person and I don't have uh, treaty rights is because um, my grandmother, her name was Viola Mary Gagne. Um, a lot of people have the middle name Mary, that's a Catholic uh, influence. And her uh, mother was Anne Jane Manasse. Although I know who my uh, grandmother is, um, and I, of course I know who my father is, Rodney Peter Gagne, and uh, I don't know who his father was. So uh, that would be my grandfather, so I really don't know who he was. And um, she, my, I did know my grandmother, but she never told me who he was, and I don't think she ever told my father. So I have an unknown paternity in my lineage. It's an unknown grandfather. So I am... Um, so the, what happened when they um, amended the Indian Act in 1985, I was watching that process. I was only 23 at the time, so that's, you know, over 27 years ago. <laughs> it was 27 years ago, and I was watching and observing this process of uh, amending the Indian Act and watching uh, Jeanette Laval and Yvonne Bedard, listening to them a little bit on the news and wondering, well, I wonder what this means for, for my family, just kind of thinking it. And um, then the Indian Act was, was amended in, in uh, 1985, and uh, I was only, you know, in my 20s, and uh, we were, I was living... Um, well, I was trying to resolve other issues like finding a job and getting out of college. And so I didn't start the research of, of who I was at, in 1985. Um, but I did slowly start to develop more of a relationship with my grandmother. And that was necessary because you, you can't just pounce on her and say, give me all your family oral history. You have to develop a relationship with these people and learn the knowledge. They have to learn that they can trust you. And, and you're worthy of the knowledge. And you're, you're, you're a proven listener. And so she began to tell me a little bit about who I was. And she lived in Hallibury, uh, Hall Halibury, Halibury, um, which is quite a distance away from Toronto, and um, so just had to, you know, maintain um, contact with her over the phone and through letters and visiting her once in a while, and she started to share who she was and who the family was, who, you know, her father was Joseph Gagne, and her mother was Anne-Jane Maness, and Joseph Gagne had a, a mother named Angeline Jocko, and, and he, she also married uh, Joseph Gagne, who was French, and just learning all that history and all that over and over. You have to hear it over and over. Around uh, 94 that I first applied for status registration, Indian status registration. So although I was pretty sure that my, my grandmother would get status, I wasn't sure what they were going to do. And I, I was sure my father would get it. I wasn't quite sure what they were going to do with me and the issue of un, un, um, unknown paternity because I didn't know who he was. And so uh, my grandmother was eventually um, 
um, reinstated or registered. I think the word they like to use is registered because the official Indian register didn't happen until 1951. That's when um, Indian Northern Affairs Canada started their official rec record of who was an Indian. Previously it was this ad hoc uh, lists of the reserves. So they made her, they registered her as an Indian and uh, initially they registered her as a 6-2 which is a lesser form of Indian this. And so I had to do some more archival research, um, have her upgraded to a 6-1, and then my father was given status a 6-2, and I wasn't sure what they were going to do with this unknown paternity and how it would affect me. I was quite shocked when I learned that they didn't give me status and that they, um, they assumed that uh, my, uh, my grandfather was a non-Indian man, even though we don't know who he was. They... They, uh, they did a negative assumption of paternity, meaning they assumed he was non-native. So that was really uh, kind of interesting because I knew that prior to 1985, they did have pr provisions to protect in indigenous babies born to uh, women, um, born out of wedlock and born of unknown paternity. I knew that prior to 1985, they did have provisions to protect those children. And since um, what really kind of uh, I couldn't believe was that the Indian Act was amended to bring it in line with the Charter of Human, uh, the Charter of Charter of Rights and Freedoms, right? And so um, it's like, well, it's violating, right? It's violating my my rights and freedoms. Uh, so I was very um, confused about about that process, um, and then. Um, I, uh, f when I filed, they said, you know, you've been denied. And then this is around 1995, which is about 10 years after the Indian Act was amended. So it took me a long time to do the oral history and the, well, really getting to know my grandmother and then to do the archival research was very hard. So it took me 10 years. And they denied me. And then I walked into Aboriginal Legal Services of Toronto. And I said, will you take my case? And that was a real rite of passage for me. And then I walked through that threshold into Aboriginal Legal Services, and I said, will you take my case? And they said, sure. Uh, you know, where have you been? <laughs> what took you so long? And so um, I, I told them I was denied because of unknown paternity. And they, so they gathered a few more uh, a few more things, and they submitted it to, uh, it was at that time, um, INAC, right? Indian Northern Development Canada, what is it? Indian Northern Affairs? It's, yeah, Canada, INAC, yes. Now they've changed their name to um, Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada, but at the time it was INAC. So they submitted some more materials, and they said, no, you were correctly omitted from the Indian Register then. <laughs> and so then uh, that was um, because of an unknown paternity. And so... Um, because they were assuming the, the, the my grandfather was white man. They really they they don't know. They I don't know. It could have been an Indian person. And so um, we Aboriginal legal services agreed to bring my case through the court system. And I'm really grateful to that for that process. Kimberly Murray and and uh, Krista Krista Big Canoe have been really. Um, um, amazing and supportive people and helping me move the case forward. And so Kimberly, uh, Aboriginal Legal Services, filed a statement of claim. And that statement of claim, they, um, their argument was geared towards the registrar's practice. And the reason they did that was because the Register of INAC, there's nothing in the Indian Act that says, in the event of an unknown paternity, assume the father is a non-Indian person. There's nothing in the legislation that says that. It's silent. It just doesn't address it. Like prior to 1985, they said, in the case of an unknown or an unstated paternity, um, uh, born child born out of wedlock, the child is like the mother. They took those provisions out in 85, and now they were silent. So since the knowledge that registers knowledge or practice was not codified in the legislation, they directed their complaint to the registrar's practice. And um, it was struck. My first statement of claim was struck. It was 2001. And um, 
it was really disappointing. And the argument was that you can't challenge the registered practice. You have to challenge the Indian Act. But at the appeal court, um, it, they upheld the lower court decision. And so my lawyers of Aboriginal Legal Services had to refile the statement of claim the following year. I think it was in 2002. Why put me through the process of what Jeanette and Yvonne went through and Sandra Lovelace went through? Just if the Indian Act was amended to bring it in line with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, why do we have to, first of all, why put us through that process? But second of all, if it's not in the legislation, just ch change the internal policy you're using. It's much easier to change a policy than it is to change a piece of legislation. I've been going at this for 27 years. They could have just changed the policy. How long could that take? Six months. So it's obvious they're still motivated to make less and less Indians. And so um, that's when... Um, that's when my <laughs> court case started. It was uh, started in 1985, but it wasn't. I didn't officially apply until 95, and then the statement of claim was filed in 2001, 2002, and so now it's 2012, and we still haven't um, we still haven't uh, made our way into the court. So a couple years ago, after I finished my doctorate, I went, okay, this is my time. I have to start a national strategy and raise awareness about this issue because nobody's talking about it, and it's a big issue. So I, I uh, really, it was actually a really difficult thing to do. I just, I, I learned how to build a website, and a large section of the website, I, I um, labeled it a national strategy to raise awareness of unknown and unstated paternity and the Indian Act, which is a mouthful. So, <laughs> so I have no funding, no bricks, no mortar, no, no, <laughs> no assistance, just me and my website. <laughs> and um, so that's when I started to raise awareness. More people are now becoming f familiar with it because I've taken a real social media approach to raising awareness about it. I've moved into Facebook and... and um, uh, circulating a lot of things through email. And so the issue of unknown and unstated paternity um, is, a, is a real big issue, and I've been doing a lot of work on it in the, <laughs> the last two years. Um, now, um, Aboriginal Affairs in Northern Development Canada has an internal policy where they address unstated paternity. They won't even use the discourse of unknown paternity. So just so you know that difference, right? So, so um, if you look at that number of 13,000 between 1985 and 1999, and you extrapolate that number forward to the year 2012, t as many as 25,000 children have been denied Indian status entitlement, band membership, citizenship in their First Nations, rights to housing, rights to their treaty, their, ra their treaty rights, health and education, so essentially, when you when you comes down to understanding um, understanding genocide and um, really Canada's committed the genocide of twenty five thousand babies, Indigenous babies, born of unknown and unstated paternity. So what Canada is doing now is to eliminate status Indian status is they're targeting young women and their babies, the most vulnerable in the, in our societies. They are targeting them in their, in their agenda to get rid of and eliminate status Indians and their treaty rights. Because again, it's through status Indian that you get your treaty rights. That's why I read that whole bundle about treaty rights. So I, I, identity, Indian status registration is not just about identity, and that's huge. Cultural identity is huge. I think I, I've, I've stated that. It's also about those treaty rights that the Foundation of Canada is, is built on. It's, it's about eliminating those treaty rights. Um, I think what's really important, too, is that Indigenous women, most people know now that Indigenous women are, have been victims of a lot of uh, violence and abuse and, and uh, rape. It's actually said that 57% um, 50, of Indigenous women will be exposed to sexual abuse. And... Um, what what I'm getting at there and why it's really important is that in the situation where a child is born, a child is conceived through the violence of rape, sexual violence of rape, that child is denied who they are. If their mother is a 6'2", registered under 6'2", of the Indian Act, 
that child is denied being an Indian, even in situations of rape. So that's a very disturbing, disturbing uh, fact. Right? So through policy and law, the Indian Act, and their policy of, of assuming the father is non-Indian, they're perpetuating the violence against women who are already marginalized and oppressed. And when you also look at um, mothers under 15, 45% uh, the of the, of the um, babies um, are unstated and unknown paternity. I'm going to say unknown and unstated paternity. So that's mothers... Uh, young women, really, young girls, 15 years and, and um, younger, 45% of the fathers are uh, not known. And we all, uh, um, violence occurs more to younger women. So, um, and then as the mother age, it, it goes up to 12%. So when a mother's in their 30s, there's still um, a lot of issues of unknown and unstated paternity. So again, what Canada is doing is um, making the most vulnerable in our society, um, targeting the most vulnerable in our society in their agenda to get rid of status Indians. And that's horrible. And that's a human rights violation, that's genocide, and that is, um, that is shameful, absolutely shameful that they would do that to you. There's nothing more important than being a mother. And. Um, Indigenous women already have so many layers of oppression, like poverty, um, abuse, um, violence, uh, higher rate of disability, three times the national average. Um, so that's horrible that Canada would, uh, would continue on with that agenda, targeting the, the most vulnerable. I think also what's really important in understanding the issue of unstated and unknown paternity, and Canada is no fool at doing this, I believe they're no fool at doing this, they stick with the language of unstated paternity. They don't want to talk about unknown paternity, but there's a lot of women out there, and this was just pointed out to me recently, that it, it's also good to use the term un, unrecognized paternity. Because um, a lot of mothers name the fathers, but the father's not there at the time of birth. And what uh, the government officials do is if the signature's not there, they blank the name out. So it's really an unrecognized paternity. And another thing that's really important is there's unnamed and, uh, well, there's unnamed and unestablished. Some mothers don't want to know who the, they don't want to um, name the father because of issues of incest and issues of power. They don't want the father to be around the child. So there's a legitimate reason not to name the father. Then there's also um, another one, unacknowledged. Some fathers won't acknowledge their children because they don't want to pay child support. They don't want to lose their license. So you see how there's many layers there, right? It's, although the government of Canada is just calling it unstated, actually when you look at that, there is um, unrecognized and there's um, unacknowledged and there's um, unnamed and then there's unknown, such as in my case. I will never know who um, my grandfather is, but also, as I said, some women conceive through rape. So there's those layers of issues with paternity. Traditionally, um, baby, a baby was that of the mother, right? So it's uh, quite disturbing what they're doing. And it's quite um, layered. It's quite layered, and so the government is very, um, I believe, very strategic in their use of only saying unstated, because it takes a lot of thinking to go, okay, let's think about this deeper. Let's think, how are you going to find a legal remedy for all those situations? And that's really important to think about the legal remedy, because um, that's what I'm looking for, is a legal remedy, right? So, um, but what I um, think is really important in 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 my story, and, and I have done a lot of learning, and I would much prefer not to do this. <laughs> you know, 27 years is, is quite a long time. But um, I much prefer to, to look at uh, the resurgence of Indigenous knowledge, which I am involved in in part. But what I have learned was that, um, you know, Mary Tuax Early, she started a long time ago in the 70s. 
Jeanette Laval and Yvonne Bedard, they went to the Supreme Court in 73. And um, Sandra Lovelace, she went to the um, United Nations, right? And Sharon MacGyver, she's gone through 25 years, and now there's um, the work I'm doing. What I have learned is that, um, and I'm going to parallel this to the treaty process. When you look at the treaty process and how it shifted and slithered over time, and that's the adjective I like, slithered, you realize that the government has, um, is using a split tongue discourse. They're still using that forked tongue discourse. And they're still playing games. They're still playing games with their policy. So they may have shifted it from extinguishment of our land rights. And now they're using words like, like relinquishment. And they're using their own policies. So we, now we negotiate, um, we negotiate land claim and self-government process, which is a different word than treaty. We negotiate it through federal policy. So this is the inherent right policy. And this is the land claim policy, right? And these are unilaterally drafted policy. So that is an act of genocide, right? They're imposing their policies on us to negotiate um, land claim and self-government process. I don't even use the word treaty anymore because it's just ridiculous. It's not a treaty. We, what is happening is we're negotiating a land claim and self-government process through their policy, through their colonial policy. Their policy has shifted. Eventually, instead of talking about a blanket extinguishment, they shifted now to the need to relinquish. Indigenous people have to relinquish their lands or define them completely. So you hear a little discourse shift, but really the bottom line is it's the same. They're just tinkering with their policy, and they have the same policy goal. And when you look at the Indian Act, the whole purpose of the amendments in 1985 was to eliminate the sex discrimination. That was the purpose of the amendment in 1985. Well, they obviously didn't eliminate the sex discrimination. Chair McGarver took 25 years to challenge the second generation cutoff rule. So when the um, government of Canada claimed to have eliminated the sex discrimination they, in the Indian Act, they uh, invented the second generation cutoff rule. What happened, though, is they were applying it sooner to the grandmothers than the grandfathers. So there was still a gender inequity. So what was the point of, of all that work, right? I mean, these are intelligent people. They have intelligent policy makers, right? They have a lot of money, deep pockets to, to have very good policy makers. They could have eliminated the sex discrimination. Obviously, they didn't want to. They weren't motivated to. They, took, they forced Chair McGarver to go through 25 years of challenging the second generation cutoff rule, and they amended it again in 2011. And in 2011, they did it again. They, the, the, the legal remedy was so narrow, it didn't eliminate all the sex discrimination. And that's unnecessary. In a, in a post-charter era, that's completely unnecessary. And then also when you think about my situation where they're, they could have changed, they could just change the policy in the department. But what now they've done is they forced me into 27 years of, of, of a gender, sex, sex uh, equality, inequality battle, which is unnecessary. Um, it shows to me that the government is just tinkering with their policies and their legislation. They're, say, with this, they're just tinkering it with a little, uh, tinkering it here, changing the discourse here, but the policy goal is the same. So they're not genuinely interested in eliminating the, gen the sex discrimination. They're not genuinely interested in honoring Indigenous people's human rights. Um, and um, also, well, actually, what it's what um, the term is, what they have done is they've crafted better instruments. But I don't think that's true anymore. They haven't crafted, the, the, well, what that means is they've engaged in a process of instrumental learning. They've learned how to shift their instruments, their, tech, their, their legislation and their policies, just shift the discourse and create an illusion of change, but don't really create a change. Tangle these women's agency, Mary Tuax Early, Jeanette Laval, Yvonne Bedard, Sandra Lovelace, Sharon McIver, Lynn Gale, let's, let's tangle their agency up. Let's, let's tangle them up and, and let them waste their time playing with our, our, uh, our documents and, and um, at the same time continue to uh, commit genocide against them. And then produce propaganda that points out their culture is useless. You know, it's fluffs and feathers. So um, 
it's really quite disappointing, that lesson, to learn, to, to come here 27 years later and go, holy cow, how naive was I to think that things were ever going to change? Obviously, um, they're full, aware, full well aware of what they're doing to us. Um, I have to say Jeanette Laval. You know, she, um, she was always an a interesting person. Um, of course, um, now it's, it's uh, all those women before me that I've already named, those important women. Um, Sharon MacGyver. She's a very intelligent woman, very impressive and very inspiring. And if she thinks this is important, that affirms to me that it is important. I think I get a lot of uh, backlash over the work I do. A lot of people don't understand the work that I'm doing. Um, some people think I suffer from a colonial mindset uh, because I'm tinkering with an Indian act that, uh, you know, they shouldn't be able to define who we are. And um, I think, well, you know, this isn't about me. It's about 25,000 babies and young mothers.